Hi folks. Anyone who's been a machinist or has made parts knows there's a lot of work that goes into the CAD, the CAM, the fixturing, the work holding, and machining a part. We're not at the point where we have an automated process, but I love finding ways that can help break down some of those barriers. And today I've got this idea for a template that can help create a part with no extra work on the cam side of things. It works really well for a relatively simple part like this sign, sort of a two and a half axis type part. And it reminds me of this concept of efficiency. I used to think that efficiency, especially in terms of machining, meant how quickly we could make the part. Efficiency to me really means how much I'm able to get done. And sometimes I just wanna drop a file into Fusion post the code, drop it on the machine, and go do something else. I don't really care if the part takes a half an hour or three hours to make. And this could work great, whether you're on a little Shapeoko or a Tormach or a, a huge machine. So there's a couple really good fusion tricks to this. Let's dive in. So we've got our sign. It is approximately 30 inches wide by 12 inches tall. It's a relatively large part. We've got a main 3D adaptive rupping operation. We're using the relatively new feature from Fusion called flat. Uh, it kind of replaces horizontal and fixes some of the bugs and shortcomings of horizontal. And finally, we've got a 3D contour. If you've seen us talk about 3D contour in other videos, it's under the 3D menu, and it's described as a best strategy for finishing steep walls. Basically, it's really often used for surfacing operations. But you can also think of 3D contour as a 2D contour that's feature aware. That's the difference between the items in the 2D menu drop down in the 3D menu dropdown. 2D toolpaths are completely unintelligent. Fusion has no idea what you want it to do until you start clicking on lines or planes. 3D toolpaths are all intelligent. They are aware of what your solid model looks like. And when you create a toolpath from one of these menus, it will try to machine your whole part. And in fact, what you start doing is selecting areas via containment zones to reduce where that toolpath is doing work. But what makes it great for this idea of having an automated cam workflow is that we can rough our part, we can machine all the flat surfaces, and we can machine all of the sidewalls. We're gonna do this on a 24R, so I wanna do that with one tool. Again, not the most efficiency from a actual machining standpoint, but it is from the sense of set it and forget it. Like so many signs though, there are some of those little details, so we will have to come back with a smaller tool to get some of the text in there. If your machine has a tool changer, you don't need to do this, but still, I'd argue it's a pretty good win if you can do two or three hours of work, come back later and do that final details or say chamfering, and heck, you can even be programming those additional downstream parts while the first op is running. One of the other big takeaways to remember, and it really relates more to doing work with large tool paths and large physical parts, on the adaptive style tool paths, Fusion is actually tessellating your model in the background. So it's taking this beautiful, simple, solid model that's an incredibly low file size, and it's turning it into thousands or even millions of triangles to, uh, in this case, understand the adaptive toolpath strategy to maintain that constant engagement. It's a really good thing, except the tolerance in Fusion relates to how detailed it wants to make those triangles in that tessellated STL file match your solid model. And the problem is if you try to make your tolerance too small on a physically large part, it's gonna be incredibly taxing on your computer. So I'd recommend making sure you have a tolerance set high or worst case, set it really high while you're troubleshooting your toolpath or helping figure out what you want. And then once you like it, you can lower it back down to the value you prefer, in this case, say four thousandths of an inch. It may take a minute to calculate, but once it's done, you could right click and protect that toolpath to prevent it from regenerating. One other thing to note, you shouldn't allow the sum of the tolerance value, plus if you have smoothing checked, that value as well, to be more than your radial stock to leave or you do risk gouging your part. When you're ready to machine a new part with this template, activate the part container file, right click, insert into current design, that adds our file in, I can remove our old part, hop back into manufacturing, right click, generate, We've got our main adaptive, the flat that finishes the top, and our 3D contour that finishes all of our straight sidewalls. And we don't get a tool path for the T18 here, the finishing end mill. And honestly, I wish Fusion could do a better job explaining why. It just says empty tool path. And the reason you don't get one is you don't need it. 
it was able to do everything it needed to do with the quarter inch end mill. So coming down here to the smaller one eighth inch end mill is unnecessary because the rest machining, there's nothing left. Now it's time to put this automated cam technique to the test. The first thing we're gonna talk about is the setup. We're gonna hold the stock to the machine with a super glue technique with a piece of MDF in between as a sandwich. The reason for that is because I wanna be able to fully contour the part around the outside. I taped down the piece of MDF and then I faced it with a two inch tool. I think I took a hundred thou off the top and the dust boot just works fantastic. There was no MDF dust in the air at all. The next step was to make sure I could have the stock parallel with the machine just so I wouldn't have any unexpected loads or any kind of unexpected cutting going on. I used the probe just to make sure I could keep the stock straight and then I super glue taped the stock onto the MDF. The tool we're going to be using for the majority of this project is a quarter inch Lakeshore Carbide Variable 3 Flute. I like using these tools for routers because they are ZR encoded and they have a small corner radius which helps a lot with tool life. I just had to install my tool, generate my tool paths, and start going over the feeds and speeds. I know this looks kind of crazy, but remember the stock size is 30.5 by 12.5 and we are using a quarter inch tool. So we have a lot of material to remove. We'll be running at 24,000 RPM, which is the max RPM for the 24R, 144 inches per minute. We have an optimal load of 35 thou and a maximum roughing step down of 0.55. Flat area detection is enabled, stock to leave 10 thou, axial and radial. Smoothing is 1 thou, tolerance is 4 thou, which is less than the stock to leave, so we're good to go there. One thing I like to do is add rest machining from the setup stock, and I like to machine the cusp because I didn't know if there was gonna be any kind of rotation in this stock. So what this does, is it starts cutting outside the stock area 100 thou. That way it just gently eases into it. Reduced air cutting, always good. For the first roughing step down, I didn't use the dust boot just because I wanted to see how well the mist was actually hitting the tool and to make sure my helixine would evacuate chips properly. For the second step down, I actually used the dust boot and it worked amazing. Next up is the flat tool path. The main difference here is I reduced the spindle RPM from 24,000 to 12,000, mainly because I wanted to reduce the feed rate. Instead of a feed rate of 144 like the roughing, I'm now running a feed rate of 54 and a feed per tooth of 1.5 thou. I have a step over of 0.175 and I actually did add a finishing pass of 5 thou because I wanted the finish to be very consistent. I also added 5 thou radial stock to leave. Remember we had 10 thou radial on that adaptive. So this means with that finishing pass, it would ease into the stock left on the walls and it wouldn't really add any kind of extra load that would cause any kind of issues with the finish. A couple notes I wanna add are in the linking tab. For the leads and transitions, the transition type you want no contact for the most aesthetic cut. And what that means is it's not going to drag in between starts and stops on the toolpath. I also like to use ramping for some of the machines that aren't the most rigid, that just lets it ease into the surface so you don't have any kind of weird bumps and bobbles. I usually use a profile ramp or a helix. Last up for this quarter inch tool is the 3D contour. Once again, I lowered the spindle RPM now to 10,000 and I'm running a feed rate of 50 inches per minute. Now Fusion tells me that's a feed per tooth of 1.6 thou, but remember, we only have five thou left on the radial walls, which is what this contour is gonna clean up. So chip load is actually right around half a thou, which is about the minimum that I wanna cut with a quarter inch tool. Nothing special over here. We have a tolerance of four tenths, a maximum step down of a quarter inch, smoothing on. And this time I decided to turn feed optimization on because in these corners, we're gonna have much higher tool engagement. So I wanted to slow it down just a little bit. Now, some people do like repeating the finishing pass, which is gonna repeat a full depth pass around all your contours. But I've found that in some of the machines that aren't as rigid, 
sometimes it'll actually make the finish worse. So try it once and see what you like. Okay, we're in the home stretch. Now it's time to load in a smaller tool and cut out these letters right here and some of the details on the top. What I did was I duplicated that previous 3D contour tool path and then I switched the tool to an eighth inch single flute Amana. I like running single flutes for smaller stuff like this because these letters only had about 20 thou more space than the size of the tool and single flutes just evacuate ships better and the last thing I wanted to do was mess this sign up at the last moment. So threw the single flute in there, ran it at 24,000 RPM. Again, the Tormach 24R max RPM, 48 inches a minute for a chip load of 2,000. We were slotting and we had a maximum step down of a little bit over 12,000. Again, nice and easy. And I did ramp in profile at two degrees. You know we had to add some chamfers, right? We couldn't just leave it alone all sharp. This was actually the only toolpath that I had to pick features, which is kind of cool. Nothing special here. I just went with a quarter inch, 90 degree chamfer mill, run it pretty high RPM, 20 thou, 20 uh, inches per minute. Feeds a little low for you guys that are wondering because I only had a offset of 40 thou. Chamfer width, 20 thou, so nothing crazy, just something to break the edges and I don't know, make it just perfect. While this sign looks absolutely gorgeous coming right off the 24R, we want to make it just pop and give it that little bit of extra touch. So we've decided to do an epoxy backfill on the letters and the pockets around this area. As you can see, I already did one test. This is about the same depth as this. I did a little bit of a destructive testing as well to see how well it would adhere to the floor and the sidewalls. Even though it's not fully hardened, I'm actually pretty impressed by its strength. We're going to be doing three different colors. A ruby up here to fill these out. An obsidian for these larger letters down here. And a mixture of citron and fire opal for these pockets right here. It's a little bit of a yellow with a touch of orange. The resin we're going to be using today is Dr. Crafty. And we bought that on Amazon and it's pretty inexpensive and it seems to be pretty easy to use. Mix it one to one and it flows really nice. Gives you about an hour working time and I didn't have any issues with bubbles, but just in case, I'm gonna run a heat gun over this when I'm done. I'm not a sign maker, guys, but this technique works. I didn't really have to worry about anything. Yeah, there were some couple small things that I changed just to get that last bit out, but pretty cool technique. Try it out, see what happens. Make some chips. See you next time, guys. Whether you run a maker space or you're a teacher or you're a one-man band R&D entrepreneur, the ability to have safe, reliable, as close to automatic cam as possible for parts like this is super helpful. Uh, we've done similar things for our five axis and for our lathe. Check out the video description for links to those videos. Otherwise, folks, hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.